Welcome back to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by CEI. I'm your host, Bill Fresen. Continuing our inquiry into the educational readiness of the millennial generation, our guest for the second half of the program is Gloria Larson, president of Bentley University right here in Boston. Gloria, welcome to the program. Thanks. I'm delighted to join you today. Let me set up our conversation with a cheeky question, perhaps loaded with stereotypes. The so-called millennial generation is the most pampered generation in American history. To misquote Churchill, never has so much been handed on a platter to so few. Are they really up to the challenge of cleaning up the horrific mess we baby boomers have made? I have to tell you, in my not just seven years at Bentley University as president, but in my many, many years in private practice at a major law firm, in government, I had a chance to work with the millennials. I believe they're the most prepared of any generation to actually tackle challenges on a global scale. And the reason I say that is because I think in terms of their education, but also because the world map has shrunk so darn much and because they are so used to dealing in a tech-rich world and having information instantly accessible to them, I find this generation the first that's capable of caring about organizational bottom lines and at the same time understanding the imperatives that they and others have to address human people and clearly planet issues that we all face. But where are the challenges and hardships overcome and where are the opportunities for them to have fallen on their face and pick themselves up again? You see so little of that in their formal education. You know, I don't disagree with you that my generation, the boomers, have largely pampered this generation of kids. These are the kids who get a prize no matter where Mm -hmm. they fall on the spectrum of athletic talents, academic talents, whatever. Having said that, these are the first kids who are truly digital age kids Mm -hmm. um, who have this ability to learn and address problem solving in ways that we just never had. And it's all instantaneous for them. I find these kids incredibly flexible. These are kids who will do a project at two in the morning and then sleep till 10 or 11 the next day. So what? This Mm. is how they roll. They actually get the job done, I think, better than I've seen in the past. Well, you know, I have a son who's a startup CEO out on the West Coast. He's a millennial, and his typical work hours are noon to 6 a.m. the next morning. It's a a different world. And and I see that here at Bentley University. My kids, who do tons of projects together, often will do their best teamwork in the middle of the night. The next day, they're out on the playing fields. They're in classes. They're actually a very focused group. I think it's because they're great multitaskers. By the way, with all the pampering, these are the kids who've been strivers as well. They want to make good grades. They want to be successful. At the same time, they see success in a well-rounded way. At least the kids I work with do. They want to be athletic. They want to play sports at any level that works for them, even if it's just working out. They want to join clubs. Heck, at my school, they want to all be presidents of the club. (laughs) And they think they all deserve to be president. If these kids are so good, why did you have to start the Prepared You Project? They've let themselves down in some ways, but more to the point, the economy's let them down in a really, truly way. The global meltdown, U.S. uh, economic recession, has really put employment in a world of hurt. We all know that firms aren't hiring Mm -hmm. at the pre recession They're in the bunkers. Everybody's hiding, waiting for the next shoe to drop. And who has it hit in particular, in addition to those with just high school degrees or less? It's hit the most recently graduated from college. Oh, look at youth unemployment in Europe. I think Greece just hit 46% youth unemployment. It's unbelievable. Well, yesterday the New York Times wrote an op-ed saying, look, the millennials are really hurting. It's not those who've been out in the workplace for five years. It's those who are 22, 23 years old who've just graduated. But a big chunk of it has been laid at the feet of higher education. Well, aren't you the ones who are running up their debts? I mean, these kids are graduating with $100,000 worth of debt. This was unheard of in my day. There have been lots of surveys that show over 50% of employers believe that today's generation of newly minted grads is less prepared than those of a decade ago. It's when you pierce the veil and try to find out what does preparation really mean that you find that employers themselves aren't sure what they really want. But what has happened in our economy for newly minted graduates is that they come in with a college degree in journalism, in history, in English, and in the old days, 
business would have said, wow, I think you're a great kid. I'm going to hire you and I'm going to train you. That's not happening anymore. That all got cut out with the recession. So today the kid comes in and the employer knows that a college degree with a healthy dose of liberal arts may prepare this young graduate for a successful long-term career and for a great life, but it may not at all have prepared them for the first day on the first job. And if you've got a thousand applicants for one job, you can look for the one needle in the haystack, the one young graduate who actually has that capability to hit the ground running. And that's where the hard skills come in. There are a lot of mixed messages, and that's what we found in our survey. So aside from recommending that kids get engineering degrees instead of liberal arts degrees, <laughs> what are you doing about it? Well, what we're... <laughs> Well, we're not the ones recommending um, engineering oh, oh. degrees. I know that's what you have, <laughs> but we're a standalone business university. And here's my point. We believe it's an and, not an or. Our kids get equal doses of business courses, so they have professional skill sets and a knowledge of the real world, and at the same time, equal doses of liberal arts. We think that's essential for learning strong communication skills. It's where the kids really learn to write. In fairness, I didn't learn to write till I turned 40. But it's also where they learn critical thinking and creativity. It's this combination of things that work. Not every kid should major in business. We're certainly not arguing that. But what we do believe and what the findings in our survey strongly suggest is that today you need a healthy mix of real-world orientation with whatever it is you're passionate about. So are you doing internships and externships the way, say, Northeastern has always been famous for? Northeastern really set the standard for this many, many years ago. And yes, absolutely, this is part of our recipe. If you look at what Bentley does, it has four essential parts to it. The core to everything is this unique integration of business and liberal arts. We have one single faculty. We don't have a school of arts and sciences mm. and a school of business. The second key piece is real-world orientation. Uh, having employers come into the classroom, what we call corporate immersion, where they have real case studies, but also more than 90% of my kids do at least one internship during their four years, and mm. over 60% do at least two. On graduation day, almost 50% of the kids who already have job offers got them through their internships. It's a great way to stick a toe in the workplace and understand how different it is from uh, from academia. In addition to that, it's where you first get a healthy dose of mentoring. It's where you start to not just look around you and see the way it actually operates, but in our case, our kids are taking newly minted skill sets that they're getting through their business and arts and sciences courses directly to work that day and being able to showcase them and also get them critiqued. Uh, it's how you learn best. There are two other, if I could just mention, there, yeah, yeah, yeah. Other, there are two other components to what we think of as our formula at Bentley. The third component is another one that came across loudly and clearly in this national survey that we commissioned, and that's that schools have to keep up with technology. I think I'm preaching to the choir mm -hmm. when I say that to you. Schools have to be wired and wireless and have the latest opportunities for their student to use technology so that they can deploy technology in useful ways that they can analyze and leverage big data um, it, when they get into the workplace. So technology prowess and access to the latest technologies is incredibly critical now. Well, the tools and are unbelievable like, that they have at their disposal compared to uh, us having to go off to the library. Remember going well, to libraries? That's absolutely right. And our library looks like a tech lab because it's, of course, wired and wireless mm -hmm. too. But beyond that, there's a fourth ingredient that, again, came through in in our Prepared You National Survey of literally thousands of respondents who have are key stakeholders in this debate across the country. And these are businesses that were asked to, to participate in the survey. Spend a minute just describing this, the survey itself. Prepared You was an initiative that we undertook because we were so worried about all of the criticism that was being leveled toward both millennials and to the universities and colleges that were graduating them. So we hired a third-party research firm, KRC Research, mm -hmm. They surveyed over 3,000 respondents across nine different audiences, but in a nutshell, they were really looking for answers from CEOs, C-suite executives, from hiring managers, the people on the front right, line were hiring, for? from millennials themselves, both in school uh, and those who had graduated recently. We talked to their parents, and we talked to higher ed influentials, whether those be presidents, deans, provosts, faculty members. And we asked them over 300 questions that covered 11 themes because we really wanted to know 
what are the problems? What's hamstringing all these recent graduates? And what can we do? More importantly, what we hadn't seen was any kind of set of solutions. Anyone had delved deeply into what's going to work here to fix this. So we wanted to see that. And another thing that came out of this survey, don't wait until someone's graduating to start talking to them about planning a career. At Bentley, we think it's our job to start on day one freshman year. Isn't that something that should start when you're about nine years old? (laughs) Well, you know what? It does. But who, when they're nine, and how many of us, even when they're 17 or 18, know what they want to do with their lives? Lord knows (laughs) I didn't. Uh, When I graduated from college, I knew I had a great liberal arts degree. What I also knew I didn't have were any discernible skill sets that were actually employable in the real world, which is why I promptly went to law school. Such a different experience. Because I wanted that professional degree to accompany the great liberal arts education I'd gotten. What we found, though, was that whether it was the millennials themselves, employers, or higher ed influentials, everybody agrees that you need to start early so that you can pair your passion with some pragmatic skill sets so that you can start to think about getting an internship while you're still in school. Uh, let's focus on that subject for a minute. I'm l- looking sure. at your material. I, you know, one of the outcomes I see from the study is that millennials really want careers that match their values and passions. And it lists in there right at the top social responsibility and green conscious innovation. I mean, most of these businesses like Solyndra have been economic disasters, and the rest are just not scaling, at least not without massive government subsidies. How many people can we have go into those fields? Well, I think that you're applying a limited interpretation to that particular finding. When I think about these kids, and this is how I started our discussion today, to me, this is the first generation that is genuinely triple bottom line. They really do come out of high school and college now thinking people, planet, profit, and that these things are completely integrated and should be. It's why business has gotten such a bad rap. All of the Wall Street headlines have not helped the millennials believe that business actually wants to do more than just have a successful bottom line. The truth is most businesses have moved heavily in that direction. What used to be, I think, not too much more 20 years ago than cause advertising by some has now translated these days into a genuine concern for the communities that businesses operate in and for the people that are impacted. And I think millennials are looking from that in the business world, and I think they can find it in every sector in the business world. And you're right, there have been some great company ideas that are now, you know, just a a Don't survive the brush with reality. You know, that's reality is pretty tough out there when you have to, to meet a payroll and you've got to sell a product for more than it costs you to make it. These are basics that come first. Exactly. But what I hear from employers is that this generation has helped move employers more and more toward this triple bottom line thinking. Uh, When they have now a whole generation in their midst who believe it's part of your overarching responsibility. The last 15 years, I would argue that businesses themselves have decided that they can no longer operate the way they did in the past. Some of it's due to altruism and some of it's that genuine feeling that we should do more. And some of it is that everybody realizes that's a better way to do business and your clients want it, your customers want you to behave that way. Everyone's looking at social responsibility on a spectrum as being important now. And the millennials, more than any prior generation, aren't just expecting it. They're really demanding it. Well, they're going to have their turn to run those companies. We'll, we'll see how they do. <laughs> let me let me come back to a comment you made about mentoring and critiques. I'm 60 years old. I'm still seeking out mentors, especially as I go into new areas. I've always had mentors, and I, I do a lot of mentoring of younger people. But let me share an observation made by the CEO of one of our portfolio companies. And this guy's a distinguished Naval Academy grad. He served 20 years as a fighter pilot before going into his business career. He came up through the ranks of GE moved into general management, and we recruited him to turn around a small startup staffed almost entirely by millennials. And I remember talking to him. The one thing that shocked him the most was how unable they were to take any criticism of their performance. They were just so accustomed to being told how wonderful they were when they sat down for their performance review. And, you know, he gives tough performance reviews. I mean, there were tears. There were pushback. There was denial. It was was something he's never experienced before. Is this perception widely shared, or did he have a unique experience? I don't think he had a unique experience. I think the millennials, like every prior generation, are having uh, their challenges moving from one part of their lives, 
high school, college, into the real world. Perhaps this is a more sheltered generation than prior generations have been. But what we find in our school is that these kids are getting plenty of critiques during their college experience. I don't know what happened Mm -hmm. in high school, but I can tell you that here they're getting a real dose of that reality. And they're getting it through, again, through internships. If you combine a college experience that has a dose of reality attached And in addition to that, you're pairing it with some actual real-world experience. I think you're going to find that they will be prepared to then step into that first professional post and grow along with the critiques that they'll receive during the course of their career. One thing I would say, though, about millennials is they very much want to do well. These are kids who have been used to getting prizes, but they want to continue to have that success in their lives. So they may fall short a time or two. They may trip a time or two uh, when they hear that tough criticism, but they're going to pick themselves back up and they're going to want to then move forward and they will have assimilated what they've been told. Are their expectations realistic? They can't all be president. I think they're realistic once they've had some experience in the outside world. You know what all of this reminds me of? Reminds me of the old play, and I guess it was turned into a movie, Bye Bye Birdie. There's a great song in that. I remember performing uh, that in high school. Called Kids, What's the Matter with Kids Today? There is no prior generation that doesn't think the one that you know, <laughs> comes after it isn't up to snuff. And in fact, all the studies show that those who are the closest to the next generation coming up have leveled the most criticism. So in this case, the boomers are pretty benignly thoughtful about the millennials. They think, oh gosh, they're kids, they'll grow up, and we think they've got a lot of promise. It's the ex-gens who are having the hardest time assimilating the millennials because they're the ones you know, just in the next lineup next mm-hmm. to them, and they can't quite see why they don't have the same tougher view of reality that they think they had when they came into the workforce. I take take all of this with a little bit of a grain of salt. They're going to get their chance because the one thing that is different between the millennials and any other generation that's come along is the amount of debt and unfunded liabilities we have loaded on their shoulders. There's 10,000 baby boomers a day retiring and these kids are supposed to be supporting the bulk of us in our old age. Where is all that going to come from? How are they going to build a successful lives on their own when they're carrying their parents? Well, you know what? Again, that's true right now, I will say, of uh, the boomers. We're all experiencing the same thing. Our parents' nest eggs may be running out. So we're the ones who are right in that throes of that now. I mean, it's, you know, everyone's feeling sort of caught, and the and ex-gens will be next and the boomers next. You're right about the debt they're settled with. That's what unprecedented levels, It's as you know, now exceeds credit card debt in our country. This is something that, to me, makes it unconscionable for the business community and higher ed to not link arms and work together to make sure everyone who graduates with a college degree is actually prepared for the new normal realities of today's tougher economic circumstances. This means a combination of hard and soft skills. It means when you go to college that you should be told you need to Pursue your passion for sure, but make sure you're doing things that add a pragmatic cast to what you're studying. Kids should go to college. If they want to study English or history, that's fabulous. It's exactly what, again, will prepare them through liberal arts with the critical thinking and writing and and presentation skills they need. But they sure ought to be taking some math and economics courses. They ought to take some business courses. They should take public speaking. They should surround themselves with opportunity. And that's where the adults come in to play. It's where colleges have more of a responsibility than I think they've been shouldering in this regard to start this conversation early and to help their students who are paying these hefty fees more than they are doing. Uh, And at the same time, the business community can't just say, geez, we're getting a lot of kids who aren't fully qualified for today's workforce. We used to train them. We don't anymore. They can do more of that. But in a really cost better, cost-efficient way, they should start partnering with colleges and universities. They should help with curriculum development. They should help bring in you know, more internships directly to campuses so that they're posted, so that kids have these opportunities. They should be doing everything they possibly can to partner. And at the same time, colleges and, and universities... And they should do that out of the goodness of their heart. 
No, they should do it because it's a pragmatic reality that our economy requires the millennials to be productive now and in the future. And the business community realizes that. The business community is saying loudly and clearly, we recognize there's a problem and we want to be part of the solution because we need these kids and we need them prepared on day one. And we also need them prepared for the long run. We want them to be the success stories in our company. Yeah, but you're peddling a vision of a general social need and a general social responsibility. Explain to me how the investment investment that an individual business makes gets returned to their bottom line. Gosh, I can easily. Um, we have many partnerships with businesses where they've helped us design curriculum. For example, Ernst & Young gave us uh, three quarters of a million dollars to redesign how accountancy and finance are taught freshman and sophomore years of college. They did that not out of the goodness of their hearts, but because that's how it's actually practiced. Are they hiring the your graduates? What was their yield when they were all done on oh, new employees my Lord. they got? They, they're, doing, they're ecstatic with the results because we're the first school in the country country to actually fully integrate those. And by the way, it's not just E and, and Y. There's some great uh, unwitting free riders here, too, who got brought along. All of the big four, all of the big accounting firms, you know, line up at Bentley. Disproportionate numbers of our kids are hired by those firms because they have the skill sets they're looking for in addition to the rest of the studies. Those are hard skills. Those are not soft skills. Those are hard skills. But E and Y partners tell me routinely the reason they come to Bentley is is because they want the kids who've got the hard skills, of course, who are going to take the CPA exams, mm -hmm. but they also want the kids here who, because they know that they've studied liberal arts. What I'm told routinely is we hire at Bentley because they'll hit the ground running on day one, but they'll also make partner five or six years from now. Well, that's a good that's return the if they could make that work. Is it fair to recommend to so many kids they go to college? After all, not everyone's up for it, and plumbers and electricians do pretty well, and their jobs can't be outsourced to China. I'm a huge longtime fan of community colleges in our country. I think we should do everything we can to Does a plumber need to go to community college? Wouldn't a plumber be better off apprenticing? I think it's great if he can apprentice. I sure hope the plumber also goes to community college because that's where you learn the business skill sets and the wherewithal to actually run a successful business. Um, it, routinely, routinely, every sector is now lining up at the doorsteps of community colleges because you do need technicians in labs and the, you know, the biotech and the green tech companies. There's a lot of opportunity for technicians. But let's go back to the plumber. But this is true for every, for every different sector. So my view is that you're right. Not every kid in our society is going to, to go to college. I hope there's an opportunity for all those who can succeed in college and who want that to have that opportunity. But beyond that, we should be making sure there are multiple avenues so that they can get at least as far as they need to, at least a two-year degree. We all know that these days in a tech-oriented world and a knowledge and information-based economy like the U.S. has, that Wherever you're going, you really ought to have at least two years of college as a baseline. What, what do you make of Peter Thiel's efforts to get kids to not go to college? You know, I think not going to college works for some discrete number of kids. I've had a number of instances to get together with young millennials who took a different course. Usually the reason they took a different course was because they had a great idea and they wanted to explore that and they also had great communication and sales skills and they wanted to get right out there and do something with their lives, sort of a la Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. But these garage ideas, you know, this works for, again, just, you know, relatively speaking, just a handful of folks. Not everybody's going to be able to do that. Yeah, it's called and 20 under 20 because people Peter only picks 20 of them, and those are pretty sharp kids. They're going to be successful no matter what they do. I think that's right. And frankly, I think these kids are also missing something. They're missing the rest of what a college learning experience is all about, which is part of the maturation process. It's not everything happening in the classroom. It's mm -hmm. also student life. It's also what happens in the classroom in terms of reading you know, great literature, of studying history. I mean, these things impact how you and I think about problem solving every Day of our Actually, that's not true. I, I would, had no exposure to literature and history until I became an adult. I was too busy studying engineering, but I spent the next 30, 40 years catching up. My life is certainly enriched by having read all that. I wouldn't miss it for the world. I didn't need to get that in college. 
You know what? We feel really differently at Bentley, and you're hearing this from the president of a standalone business university. We think what makes our kids successful over a lifetime is the integration of the kinds of skill sets and learnings that you're talking about, along with this broader lifelong learning capability and really passion for lifelong learning. We think it's where students learn to write best. Mm -hmm. um, It's where they learn to present themselves best. And we think it's a combination. You know, I started our conversation by saying one of the things I said was it's an and to us and not an or. I think too often the world has been divided into, oh, you don't have hard hard skill sets. I'm sorry, you don't have soft skill sets. Our survey showed that employers and millennials both think that both are needed and both are missing. And I think it's the integration of these that will work best over the long term. Now, I learned most of my leadership skills in my fraternity, not in my classroom. I mean, That's part. <laughs> now, what did I just say about the rest of a college experience? <laughs> so, Gloria, as we wrap this up, remind us, what exactly were the learnings out of this survey that you took? And, and what are the roles of each of the stakeholders in, in all this? Well, this is one of the most gratifying aspects of our prepared youth study. We were really concerned that we kept seeing surveys, especially of employers, who just said there is a tremendous problem. College graduates are not prepared for today's workforce. So we wanted to dive deeper, and that's what our questions did. Looking into the data, what we found was that one of the areas that all the stakeholders agreed on was that there's some things that each of them should be doing. For example, the business community really needs to partner with the university world. They need to work hard to establish internships with colleges Mm -hmm. and universities. They need to make sure that curriculum is fresh and that it relates to the real world certainly in in specific disciplines. Um, And they need to make sure that what colleges are doing to prepare their students day one through career planning offices really matches with the kinds of things that they're going to want to see later on. That means that that employers should be working directly with career services offices in colleges. And then on the university's part, I found it personally gratifying that almost 50% of colleges and universities gave themselves a C or low when it comes to preparing today's workforce. Uh, I wish it had so been over 50%, <laughs> but we're making, we're making some progress uh-huh. here. But what the colleges and others uniformly say is, we get it. Arts and sciences, liberal arts, fabulous. Courses that actually relate even more to the real world, a great idea. But in addition to that, here's what we really need to be doing. We ha- should have robust internship programs. We should start career planning freshman year and work all four years with our students, certainly in a tougher economy, mm-hmm. to make sure they're career ready and that they've planned for entrance into the real world. And they don't go down a blind alley. And that they don't go down a blind alley. And then the third thing that colleges have to do is have state-of-the-art technology, not just to aid learning itself, but in terms of the skill sets that the kids need that will actually be deployable in the real world. It helps make them much more employable if they actually know how to get data, if they know how to analyze it, if they can then leverage it to solve problems. And nobody should be leaving college these days without that capability. Well, Gloria, it sounds like the students in Bentley are are getting their money's worth. I I appreciate you being on the show today. These kids are going to need all the help they can get paying for my Medicare and Social Security. Uh, Thanks so much for being with us. Never mind when you add mine to that. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for including me. That wraps up this week's show. Join us every Saturday at 10 a.m. and again at 6 p.m. here on Bloomberg Boston. This is Real Clear Radio Hour brought to you by CEI. Check us out at realclearradio.org where you can find this interview and all of our podcasts. You've been listening to Gloria Larson, president of Bentley University. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. See you next week.